like I said, I have the good and the bad. So some days the uh, the bad overweigh the good. And those are the days that I that I leaned on God the most. And I, I trust that he's gonna get me through that day. And then every day gets a little bit easier. And every day gets a little bit easier until I'm back sitting on my throne and my crown and adjusting my crown as the queen I am. But when I look in the mirror, I see a girl beautifully broken, perfectly flawed. I don't even know. Who knew that I would leave home one day at 12 o'clock with the sun shot shining bright and my little girl standing at the screen door yelling for me and here I am the sole supplier of my children, my family, and I'm going to chase down a car, a dream, a fantasy for a man that could care less about, you know, who I was or what I had to do when I got back to that house with the four children. And I went from the brutal attack on that day happening to me and literally being in a coma for a month uh, struggling to fight to get back to who I was as a mother, but not only that, getting addicted to the morphine in the hospital, so having to stay in there extra week or two uh, to wean myself off of that. I never ever thought that that would happen to me. I was in previous relationships prior to that, and I, I knew I was spiraling, spiraling out of control um, because I attracted the wrong men over and over and over, and I just kept allowing men to come into my life, to come into my children's life. But with this particular person, I call it mashing the gas. I actually, he had the keys to my home, my cars, my life, all in a matter of a couple of weeks. So it was no coincidence that all the red flags were there and that something was going to happen. I just didn't know what. I had no idea that it was going to be this severe, that I would um, literally be a victim of two people plotting to say, I, that woman doesn't need to exist anymore. She doesn't need to live on this earth anymore. Who knew that that would be their plan? You know, when I think back, I could have been attracted to a dog. I was searching for love. I was broken. There was nothing about me that was whole. I was dancing at the strip club and I was just searching for love. Ironically, he came into the club sitting there and paid me no attention. So what intrigued me the most is that he didn't pay me any attention, but he had a game plan. He knew what he, he, knew what he was set out to do. And he was no different than any other man, except that I was in a place of saying, I want a boyfriend, how simple-minded could I have been at that time or how broken to be in a relationship in three days attached to a man that had no disregard for my life at the end of the day to leave me at a gas station to die and I'm bleeding out and I'm dying and he walks out of there as if I'm nothing. To me, then I said you can get through it you just have to believe it was a lot that the dynamics changed in my family. It, it caused my children to go into survival mode. So I thought I was surviving domestic violence two or three times previously. But what really changed on that day was the strength of my children. And every, all of us had to step up. So can you imagine my children being told that you can't go in to see your mother because we have to wait until we pronounce her dead for you guys to come in because you're too young. The mindset of my children totally changed. Their mother is fighting for her life all because of a relationship, all because of, a, of brokenness, all because of trying to cater to a man that didn't love me in the, in the beginning. And I think what changed most was my children stepping up and saying, you know what, regardless, we've seen all this happen with mama and we accepted everything that she did. But man, like this was, this was one of the worst mistakes of her life, this was a bad choice. But they, they never wavered, they was always there. There was a lot of eye surgeries, a lot of skin grafts, a lot of sitting in this big tank that was very painful. Um, I had to go back and forth to Augusta Burn Center so many times. There was so many people that got a lot of tra traffic tickets. 
trying to get to see me or coming from seeing me. Um, Montez, my daddy was there every day. My mama, you know, as I said, my children couldn't come down there. I remember Keisha finally coming, or at least I think they snuck her in. Uh, but um, a lot, a lot of surgeries on my eyes. And so it began with um, them telling me that donor corneas, they were saying that um, they would take me into surgery and say, this is a school teacher's eyes, or this is a firefighter's eyes, or, you know, this is a house housewife eyes. And I began, it was so many times that they would say that, and I would, you know, and it would fail, and they continued to fail, all because of the, the chemicals that was thrown in my eyes. The, the donor corneas began to just start failing over and over, and it was very disappointing. So I would have a little bit of sight, for like a week or two. So I remember it got to a point where I would tell them, just don't tell me whose eyes they are because I would go home and dream about it. And I would have sight for two weeks, sometimes two months. The longest I had sight with the donor corneas was about one year. And then after so many years, now mind you, I'm going through this super depressed. So I had this thing that I did. I would go to my front door and I would look at the neighbor's door and if I could see that door, it was a good day for me. And if I couldn't, I would walk right back and get in my bed and cry. And I did this for so many years. And there was nothing else that mattered other than going to my door and looking at the neighbor's door across the street to see if I could see the outline of that door. That's how I measure, measured whether my eyes was good or working or I needed, or they were failing. Finally, after so many years, I remember Dr. Mbadi, um, who is amazing, by the way, he actually said, you're gonna be put on the list for prosthetic corneas. I didn't know what that was, I didn't know what K-Pros was, but I found out that K-Pros was plastic corneas. And so he began to do those surgeries. And that is why I was able to see for years. My kids was in high school, I was able, I, I mean, it, DeAndre was going into college, and Terry was going into middle school, and I felt so empowered being able to see. Now, there was only one eye, but I didn't care because I asked God for a vision, you know, and he gave it to me. And he gave me a little bit of a time. I was just like, hey, just give me a little bit of vision. It don't matter what it is. I just want to be able to see. I want to be able to see my children grow up. I want to be able to see my children go to school. And that's what I prayed for. So one eye at a time. And so I'll tell you the story about how I got to, to not having any sight. That was, um, my corneas was working, the K-Pros was working. Actually, they're still working to this day. They're doing great. But what happened was my retina started detaching behind my eye. And it first went the right eye and they did three emergency surgeries. Can you imagine doing three emergency surgeries back to back to back? So I'm sitting here at the hospital and I'm down there for three weeks because they can only do one every, every week. And nothing was working, everything failed. And you know, they come in and told me that I lost, I lost my right eye. Then comes the left eye, so I got one eye. So I went about five or six years. I didn't care, I had one eye. I, was, I had got my, that one eye up to 2050 vision. Now, the standard of driving is 2040, but you cannot tell me that I was not driving. So. Me and Shantara, I get her in the car, my baby girl, or whoever would drive with me. Keisha and Buddha and them, I think they were smart enough not to get in the car with me. But we go to Ingalls, I get some food, I drive back home. I was driving, I was literally at, at the point of driving. So I remember about seven years ago now, um, we were all at a restaurant, DeAndre, Marcus, Shantaria, Montez, and we were all at a seafood restaurant. <laughs> And I remember reaching over, telling Shantaria something's wrong, and she said, Mama, what is it? And I would start having blood hemorrhages on my eyes. They were like consistent, coming like every other week. I would go to the doctor, they would tell me, sit up in the bed. So prior to that day of us being at the restaurant, I had been sitting in my bed, sitting upright in my bed for almost a year, just trying to keep my sight because the blood hemorrhages got worse if I lay down. So I sat upright and this particular time, they said that I got some type of infection. 
in my eye. And I reached over to Chantera and she's like, so she rushed me in the bathroom. They're putting water in my eyes. I come back out, I said, we got to go, we got to go. Um, we get to the house. By the time we get back to my house, there was no sight. There was a parasite that had got in my eye and wreaked havoc on my, cor on my retina. DeAndre and Marcus rushed me to Atlanta. They spent the night with me. Each one of my sons was on side of the bed the entire time as I'm like panicking, struggling. I know this is the only eye I have. This is the only chance I have at sight. And unfortunately, they put me into, they took me into surgery. The one word that you never want to hear is inoperable. I remember him saying, your eye is inoperable. And I just remember everybody around me in the surgery room cutting off the music, pulling off their gloves, and I had to come home with no sight, and I have been had no sight since. So me and God, we have had a lot of battles, a lot of ups and downs. I, I, I wasn't raised in the church, and even though I'm faith-based now, um, I wasn't brought up in the church. We went to church to do, uh, we went to vacation Bible school, and like every other child, honey, I only went to get the cookies and the, and the Kool-Aid. I wasn't listening, I wasn't paying no attention, but, I think growing up, I, like, as I said, I wasn't faith-based, I wasn't into church, but I began to understand that I needed God after my attack. Now, let's be clear. It took me many years to, to come to God, to surrender, to know that God, that I needed Him to get through all of this heartache and pain. Prior to that, he was talking to me, I wasn't listening. He was trying to get my attention. I wasn't paying him any attention. I remember sitting in the car when I was dancing as a stripper and I used to cry. And I knew that something was inside of me that was changing and shifting, but I wasn't allowing it because I was, it, greed was taking over and I, all I cared about was money more so. But I would cry before I went in there. And I was like, what is this? What is this, you know? And had I paid attention to it, of course, and took heed to it, um, I probably wouldn't have gotten that relationship because um, you know that, that relationship came about three weeks after I got that feeling for a whole week and was crying in the parking lot. So something happened recently. My youngest daughter, Shantaria, she came um, to the house and we were headed out, but she, she was upset and she was crying and she said, Mama, I'm still upset by what happened to you and I'm angry and I really, like, I want to let you know I haven't gotten over it because it still affects me and it still bothers me. And so, you know me, I had my makeup on, I was looking cute, I was ready to go out the door, and I put everything down, and I said, Shantaria, I want you to understand this, and I want you to listen very carefully. What if God allows things to happen and he has he needs to make things happen and things need to happen in order to get people's attention. So what if I was one of those women that it had to happen, it needed to happen? Because sometimes God needs to use people to get other people's attention. So with that being said, do you think that people would listen to me or be inspired by me or trust me to guide them out of domestic violence relationships to guide them out of abuse if I wasn't blind. So I'm getting emotional just thinking about it because the one thing that I, I never wanted to do was let my decisions like trickle down on my children. But she don't know I cried later that night because I don't want my children to hurt. And I don't want them to feel any type of way Um, I just, I, I protected them. I've kept them from everything. And I just, I didn't want my children to feel anything with what these people did because they didn't have to do what they did. And so here it is 20 years later and my child is still feeling some type of way behind what somebody else did. That, that hurts me because I have done everything in my power to protect these children, 
I'm talking about when we was at Briar Lane and I stayed in my room for three and a half years, totally depressed, contemplated suicide. I knew exactly how I wanted to die, but I never ever let them, from the time they would get off, get, I put them on the bus, I would go back in my room and I would curl up in a ball and I would cry. I said, God help me get through this day because I don't even know, I don't even know how I'm going, I'm going to make it through this night. And then from the time I hear the first child hit the door at three o'clock, I get back up and act like ain't nothing happened. From the time, the whole time they was at school, the whole eight hours, I was laying in the bed in a fetus position, crying, asking God to help me just get through one more day. So I know that it, like, for her to say that, that's tough for me. But like everything else, I mean, we're gonna get through it. We're gonna get through it. So, um, and we got through it and she felt better and she's been feeling better ever since. The way I am now with who I am now, If it had to happen all over again, I wouldn't change a thing. I wouldn't change a thing because the woman that you are looking at now is somebody that people look up to, somebody that's changed lives. I know for a fact, without a doubt, that people are alive because of me and what I went through. And if that's the case, then I do it all over again. All the surgeries, all the pain, all the heartaches, I wouldn't change one thing. This is my moment, there's no turning back. It took me a while, but I have no regrets. It feels good to go through what I went through and then to have the platform that DeAndre has and still have and I just was along for the journey. It wasn't my story to tell. The ESPN cover story was his to tell, but I'm glad that I was there. And so, you know, after that, it seemed like everything changed. I, everywhere we went, LeBron James um, DM'd me and said, respect. But I think the biggest thing about it was that I didn't realize how much of an impact or how much I inspired other people. I think that that really showed me that the world got to see his story, what he went through, what my children went through, what I put them through. Like we didn't hide anything, we didn't change anything, we didn't fabricate anything. What you saw is what you got and I wanted DeAndre to tell his story. It was important. He to just told his story and it wasn't, it, it, it made me feel some type of way honestly because you know, now the world knows that I'm selling, that I sold dope to survive. Now the world knows that I'm a stripper. <laughs> now the world knows that your girl was selling chicken plates and babysitting and, and selling dope all in the same day, you know? That wasn't, that's not, when you look back, I don't care what, I don't care what, what it, what people say, that's not a good feeling to have a reflection of yourself being shown to the world but we were willing to do it. We had a talk a long time ago before he went into the NFL. And, you know, it was like, hey, your daddy's a kingpin. You know, your mama wasn't far behind. Do you really want this to be told? And he said, mama, look, you say whatever you got to say. So we were prepared for people to really um, hear my story. I didn't realize it would make that much of an impact, but I'm so glad, so glad, so glad that everybody got to hear our story, our survival story, the way that we had to live, the things that we had to overcome. It was very important that people know. And the bonus is that they're inspired by it. So I'm okay. Who am I most inspired by? Without a doubt, my four children. They epitomize strength, resilience, and courage. And no family is perfect. Trust me, ours is definitely not perfect, but we are imperfectly perfect together. That is my family dynamics. We have been through so much, but the one thing that people don't know about my children is that everything comes through me. So if they have a problem with each other or they disrespect or they feel like they want to disrespect each other, they call and text me. That's the weirdest thing. So I think it went back from when I wouldn't let them fight or fuss with each other. Now, I'm not gonna say all the things that happened at Briar Lane. My children will be like, mama, you can't tell it all. There were some things that happened at Briar Lane, 
baby, so, you know, it was, it's not for the magazines, it's not for people to know, but baby, it was some things went down at Briar Lane, but I'll let my children tell their story one day, I'll keep it, I will not tell y'all story, so mama gonna keep y'all secrets, we won't, we won't talk about when the police come, but anyway, <laughs> no, uh, so, no, my children, my children, my children, they inspire me, they're my inspiration, and um, without them, I am absolutely, absolutely could not do what I do and how I do it and who I am. So who my mentors? That ranges from a lot of different women. So from rappers to gospel singers uh, to actors. Uh, you have Lisa Nichols. I'm inspired by her as an inspiring motivational speaker. Uh, you have Lisa Ray because she is a fashionista and wears all the white and that's my favorite color. I love me some uh, white as everybody know. You have Trina because you know she is the baddest of the baddest. And I think lastly I'm inspired by Yolanda Adams. She uh, inspires me. My favorite gospel singer of all times. I got to meet her a few years ago and she did not disappoint. She was a beautiful goddess that walked in the room and lit the room up. And that's what I want to exemplify, walking in the room and just glowing. And so, yeah, so it's, I'm a little all in that. If you know me and you're around me, you'll know that all these women composited together makes your girl because, you know, I got a little rap in me, you know, I got a little, you know, gospel. I, I, I'm all about God's business and I'm an inspirational speaker. So there you go. Who are my heroes? Rosa Smith and Terry Smith. Hands down, my heroes are my mother and my father. Because can you imagine having three children and now you only have one left? And that's me. And even then, there was an, a brutal attempt on my life. They have been through so much, so many things. I mean, they were, they got married in 1970 back in the days when it was hard to even be a black person or, 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 you know, through segregation and desegregation and all of that. And not only to survive that, but then to have two children taken away from you at the hands of others. You know, instantly our lives was changed when my brothers uh, left this world. And my mom and dad still wake up every day with their shoulders broad and still live and still like go through this life. And I know what they go through because I experienced the same hurt. I was at the same funerals. I stood over the same caskets. So I know what they went through, but they, they still get up every day and they're of service to other people. That's the thing. My mom and dad hardly ever tell other people no when people ask them to do things. And I know they hurt cause I hurt. But those are my heroes, man, because, and you know what? The other thing that I want to say is they make me, they make me go harder. They push me through all those times when I was depressed and going through the suicidal thoughts, because how unfair would it be that you had three children and all three of your children leave this earth before you? I was not going to let them go through that. It wasn't, it's not fair to them to have to bury three children. So this is why I fight. They're my heroes. Forgiving my attackers, for, I mean, <laughs> it's like, I say it now with a smile. It wasn't always like that. I remember an older woman coming into my bedroom when I was only a year in. And she said, honey, baby, you got to forgive. These, she said, because holding on to, holding on to unforgiveness, it's gonna hurt you. You let God handle them because when, you know, they may wake up smiling, but they're gonna go to bed sad. And I never forgot what she said to me. But in my mind, I was like, you got to be kidding. I ain't forgiving nobody. These people had no business taking, you know, taking my life away from me, hurting me. But over time, I began to forgive. I began to forgive. And I'm gonna tell you a little secret, what I did, how I, how I began to forgive my attacker was, I began to put myself in her shoes. I began to see me how she saw me. I began to understand that hurt people really do hurt people. 
and that woman had been going through some really tough times and some things in her life to even think about pouring chemicals on another woman over a man. Like, you got to, you can't, you can't be sane and you can't be right. And somewhere you have got to have like some really bad things happen to you. I began to be her and I began to, when I laid down that night to pray, and this is the first time I'm saying this, I began to pray for her. I'm talking about, I'm not talking about praying for her like, well, Lord, just cover. No, I began radical prayer for her because I needed God to understand why this woman did this to me and, and what, what is the message in all of this. So I began to call her name out and humanize her, make her normal in my head because what we can do is we can imagine people to be something else. Like she's a monster, you know, she, she hurt me, but I needed to humanize her and make her the young woman that was no, no, no uh, better than me so that I could forgive her. Her initials started with SG. My initials started with SG. She was a young girl, light skin, brown skin, no different than me. So guess what? That could have been me that did that. I was broken, I was hurt. We was dealing with the same guy. So what makes her, what makes, what makes her uh, better than me or lesser than me that I can't forgive her? And when I began to do that, when I began to humanize her and understand what she could have maybe been going through, I began to heal. I began to understand that there is power in forgiveness. And I wouldn't be standing here today had I not forgave her. I don't think about it. She got out last year, May 3rd, could care less. That day I laid down and you know what I said? I said, well, God, now it's time to walk the walk because you already been talking the talk. Now it's time. Now let's see what, let's see what real forgiveness looks like. Now you're gonna have to help me with this because it may be people are gonna call me tomorrow and they're going to text me or whatever, but it doesn't matter. I'm not shaking or moved by her getting out of jail. In actuality, I, I said that if they ever came to me and there was an appeal and they wanted me to go, I wouldn't go. Forgiveness is forgiveness. It doesn't change, it doesn't alter, it doesn't waver. If I've forgiven her, why would I want her to stay in jail? I've forgiven her. And that's why I am with that. There was nothing else that they could take from me and my family. They, they took enough. They can't, they, you can't have my mind and my soul. You can't have my thoughts, you can't have my vision. And you definitely can't have where your queen is going next. You can't have it. Uh, I'm open. I am open for love. I am, I am the most open woman. I believe in romantic love. I believe in true love, full love, real love. Because the day that I don't believe in love is the day that they won. I was looking for it all in the wrong places, but I am a woman that who has evolved into this woman, this queen. You know, I am no longer a caterpillar, honey. I'm a whole butterfly that's moving and floating with a full of color and life. And so how can someone not be attracted to a full queen and a butterfly at the same time? No, seriously, I'm looking for love. And, um, and love is looking for me, you know? The Bible said that, you know, when you're ready for your Boaz, it will come. And so I'm trusting and believing on that. And so in the meantime, I'm just gonna keep working on me. There's still work to be done inside of me. And you know, when, it, when it's time, it will happen. Um, in the meantime, I'm just gonna continue loving on myself. I actually love being alone with me now. I had abandonment issues, loneliness issues. I remember I was so low that I threw myself in front of a door just to keep from a man walking out that door. We had been up all night, but when I think back, on how, how, how weak I used to be and how strong I am now, I know that love is coming. I am, because, it, because I am attracting it, I'm manifesting it, and it's, it's gonna happen. Um, I just have to be ready for it. You know, they say that God, two things, God doesn't give you something that you're not ready for. And he, he definitely can't give you some body that if somebody else is already occupying that space. Okay, so I'm keeping it open and I'm keeping my heart open because love is going to come. It doesn't matter about, you know, how, you know, where I go or who I'm with or 
you know, how much elevation I have on my family, you know, because when that right man comes into my life, he's not gonna care about any of that. The only thing he's gonna care about is looking at me, elevating me, putting me on the pedestal, and waking up every single day honoring the queen that I am. And I'm not gonna settle for that. If there is one thing that I wanted to leave in everybody's minds, what would it be? That would be that no matter what people tell you, no matter what you go through, you have to trust yourself. Always trust your gut. Always trust who you are and, which, and who you know you are. So many times I let people change me and my way of thinking, but it was never as bad as it seemed. I never should have listened to so many people. I, I've always known who I was, but I shifted so many times trying to be somebody that I wasn't. And in retrospect, it changed the outcome of my life. I want people to know that Trust your gut, trust your heart. Whoever you are, that's who you are. Always be a good person. What you put out is exactly what's gonna come back to you. This universe, baby, what I always tell my children, you know, this world will chew you up and spit you out. But it makes the, it all, what makes the difference is how you maneuver through it and how you move. People need to understand that you always, always, always have to trust who you are. And there's gonna be some things that you don't understand. It's a part of life. There's gonna be some people that you don't understand. But when you know who you are, those people will shift, they will move. God will put the right people in position to elevate you every single time. But he's not gonna give you something that you're not ready for. I want people to know that Sabrina Greenlee is a queen. She is to be honored and cherished. She is to be loved. And people need to know and look at my life. So when I'm dancing and I'm singing and I'm cutting up, that is exactly who I am. You know, country girl, country bougie. That's, that's, that's my AK, I am country bougie. But guess what, just like Master P didn't change who he was, people idolized him. Just like all these people, you know, they never shifted, they never wavered. And that's why I am now. I can't be shifted, I can't be moved, I can't easily be influenced. And that's what people need to know. When you have, when, other, when another person has enough influence on you to shift you and move you, that's strong. Think about that. Nobody should have that much power over you. Pick up the phone, you don't have to answer the phone if it's ringing. You don't have to go when they call you. Be who you are, stand in your own right, stand up straight in your own body, in your own, in your own self. And you know what, love yourself enough. And if it doesn't feel right, it doesn't seem right, trust yourself to understand it's not right. I put myself in a lot of positions because I didn't know who I was. And today, baby, today, oh yeah, I know exactly who I am. Why, because I'm not easily shifted or moved.